welcome to the last and final day of the workshop on development evaluation and reporting strategies of ai algorithms in maternal and child health once again it's a joint initiative of thsti and university of oxford over the last two days we have extensively covered uh, ai algorithm from the development to reporting however today we will uh, talk about uh, taking the technology to the target population and we'll have experts discuss with us the nuances of translation. Once again, I invite uh, Professor Aris Papagiorgio from the University uh, from Oxford Maternal and Perinatal Health Institute to introduce our keynote lecturer and lecture. Thank you. So over to you. Well, thank you, Deepika, and good morning to everyone. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Aris and it gives me a, a Super pleasure to introduce Andy. Andy is, uh, oh, is there some music playing there in the background that you can hear? Andy is um, um, an obstetrician. Uh, he's still an active obstetrician. He, he does uh, clinics and, and delivers babies, um, but is also a, a supreme researcher. His interests are in prediction of preterm birth, preeclampsia, and improving uh, global health. Uh, and he's got a particular interest in the use of blood pressure monitoring, uh, ensuring accuracy and standardization, but also creating low cost devices. Um, as I say, he's got a, 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 an active clinical role. Um, he has received numerous prizes and awards, uh, not least an OBE in 2018 for services to maternity care. Uh, thank you, Andy, for joining us. What's not on the slide is his um, uh, oh, but by the way, this is his Twitter handle. Um, Andy is a, a very avid Twitter uh, Twitterer, if that's a word. And uh, so please uh, follow Andy on, on his tw tweets. Uh, they're, they're always interesting and often entertaining too. And I know from Twitter that Andy was uh, recently in Sierra Leone uh, doing his runs and uh, doing some research work out there. Uh, now back in cold London. So thank you, Andy, for joining us in warm India today. Good. I've just had another follower join as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, one of the reasons Andy is so passionate, I think, about uh, global health is that Andy was born in Malawi and I uh, grew up in Zimbabwe. And, and you worked in South Africa as well for a number of years, didn't you, Andy? Yeah, so yeah. I'll, strong I'll connection get, there. I'll get some background there. Shall I share my slides now? Yeah. Is that, can you see them? Beautifully. Fantastic. So Aris, first of all, thank you so much for the invite. I, I really kind of relish talking to peop, interested people, particularly with more diverse, interesting backgrounds who can kind of, you know, we can learn from each other and it's good to know what other people are doing. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I just, you know, when Aris asked me, I thought, well, you know, AI, that's a bit clever. Um, the, the work I'm doing in uh, low income settings is not that clever. Um, but then he reassured me that this is about the dissemination and getting stuff out there, which we have got some experience with. So I hope in the next hour or less um, can share with you some of those experiences and try and spin them to suit the audience. Um, I have actually uh, taken a few things to market and worked with teams on commercial products. The only one of them was a medical device, which is a, actually a, a, an app um, for looking at prediction of preterm birth um, and, uh, you know, published in AI journals with that. But so I got a little bit of insight into your world, um, but by no means an expert in anything AI. But I will sort of share with you that the, the what I'm calling the uh, cradle story, um, which I think I hope you'll find interesting anyway. Um, just just to say, as um, let's check if I can move on to the next slide. So I'm I have various sources of funding. A very small amount, maybe less than five percent, is commercial, but um, I certainly have no financial interest in promotion of the cradle device. Um, it's all done altruistically and at cost. So just to declare that before this talk. Um, 
Now, I, I'm going to set up, a, you know, as Aris said, I uh, have enjoyed tweeting. I think it's a really good academic tool, actually. Um, you get stuff around far more quickly and you can see stuff far more quickly than through traditional academic routes, which is one of the reasons I took it up. But this was a slightly sobering tweet um, on Time magazine. This woman died um, from a pregnancy complication even though she survived Ebola. And I always had this kind of, you know, pre pregnancy problems and mortality around pregnancy are there day in, day out. And when Ebola hit, um, particularly in Sierra Leone, there was this massive influx of support and funding, which was very welcomed and needed. Um, and I was thinking, well, why can't we have that influx of support and help, you know, for a problem that's much easier to solve and is equally devastating. And it was kind of, sort of frustrating injustice. Interestingly, since, since the kind of Ebola outbreak, we've actually been, for example, one of the things that um, I was doing last week was um, the ambulance service in Sierra Leone was basically created from by a charity um, from the Ebola input where there were lots of ambulances lying around being unused because they were slightly out of action so a little bit of funding got them going again and so that was a really important part of um, improving triage and uh, reducing morbidity mortality because the ambulance service that second delay is a huge problem um, in low-income settings so that's just out of interest now the, the theme of my talk is really around saving lives, um, particularly maternal mortality, which there's a huge discrepancy around the world. And I've always maintained um, it's a relatively quick win and a massive social injustice. And, and as I've got older, I kind of spend more time dealing with things that I think are important in life, as we all do. Um, this story about maternal mortality in the UK has been a very interesting one. Up until relatively recently, literally the last decade or so, deaths from preeclampsia were always featured as a top three. And certainly when I was growing up and a junior doctor and a junior academic, we would always say leading cause of maternal mortality. And just in the last decade or so, preeclampsia slipped off as the least represented cause of mortality in the UK. And I find this very interesting because we haven't really got a cure for preeclampsia, it's still there. Um, you know, aspirin probably helps, but the, the point is, is it's, it's management issues, simple management issues that save lives in this condition. Um, so it's interesting that it's now the least represented cause. And um, myself and Lucy Chappell, um, along with our uh, APEC CEO, who's a lay person, got together and looked at the elements of this and why, how do we achieve this one in a million chance of dying from preeclampsia, which is pretty much, you know, the same as your male partner's chance of dying in nine months. So that's a really good success. And, and the elements are relatively simple. Um, one of our research fellows um, published this, um, showing that the elements that cause the great success of improved mortality wasn't antihypertensives, magnesium sulfate, it was really um, improved universal healthcare provision, um, surveillance and action. And that was really the great success between the 1950s and the 1970s. And more recently in the last 10 years or so, you can see that there's been this reduction in mortality. Um, and that may be attributed to sort of more subtle things like judicious aspirin use and so on um, but nevertheless we're trying to re replicate the success in the rest of the world where most of the mortality happens and this is a kind of illustration of this so you can see that the vast majority of maternal mortality is um, featured in Asia and Africa um, and in, in the, the high income setting, it, it's, it's a lot lower than it was. But even in the high income setting, there are differences. So, for example, in America, you are about 15 times more likely to die from preeclampsia than the UK. Um, both are successes. But I think the difference between the UK and North America is that we have universal health care provision so that the, the, the poorest people and the people who... Who, who perhaps need the healthcare the most are more likely to receive it. And I think that's a lesson that things, uh, simple things make a difference. And equally, if you transport a patient from West Africa to the UK, her mortality 
immediately plummet. So it's not who you are or where you come from, it's the care you receive that I think is, is the main issue. So this was the principle behind the Cradle device. Now, the Cradle programmer work, Cradle stands for this slightly long kind of sentence, but it's basically about using blood pressure and shock to um, detect problems, to do something about it. There's now Cradle, we're actually onto Cradle 5 now, um, and we're just shortlisted for Cradle 6, but, but I'm, I just want to take you through um, that, that program of work and the history behind it. And each one of these is a, a large program of work costing you know, uh, millions of dollars um, and represents a few PhDs. So they're not small undertakings, but they've gradually um, improved. And I think one, one of the issues perhaps is if, if you have an idea, you need to work slowly through the evidence base and to convince people, policymakers, that the idea um, should be going into guidelines and does make a difference. I think that's a key thing. So it's a slow burn, but that's how you, I think, get the success. As Aris mentioned, I started my life in Africa, actually, in Malawi. This is me with my mother, 1967. Um, and the reason I show this slide is we used to live in a place called Niambadwi outside Blantyre. And at the bottom of the valley was a, was a graveyard. And as a kid, I used to watch these people um, coming in with their coffins and, you know, the sort of grieving, wailing and so on. And it was quite... Uh, hard hitting for me as a kid um, and every now and then a little coffin would follow a big coffin and my mother would say you know that's probably a baby and a mother or whatever and it, it kind of lived with me from an early age that this just was not right. Um, I was lucky enough in the early late 80s to go and work in South Africa at Baraguana Hospital which I spent a year in this incredibly busy unit 37,000 deliveries when I was there all high risk referrals and witnessed huge numbers of maternal deaths. And I guess that cemented my kind of passion to want to do something about this. So that was kind of my introduction to when I went into, into academia, trying to find uh, causes for mortality. I was seconded onto a, um, as an advisor onto a WHO um, committee, uh, looking at low resource use um, blood pressure monitoring. I did my higher degree in blood pressure measurement. I worked with Michael DeSuite, who was, um, you know, pushed me in this direction. And I sort of went into academia slightly late, but um, realized that you could make a bigger difference to more people quickly by uh, pursuing it. Um, and to cut a long story short, that we came up with this kind of criteria for a device. Um, and we sat around the table thinking, you know, blood pressure is important. It causes all sorts of morbidity around cardiovascular disease, heart stroke, strokes. The world needs a device that is suited for low income settings where most of the morbidity is. Um, but actually, as an obstetrician, I was thinking maternal mortality is a big problem and blood pressure measurement is key to, to triage and action. And it's a one day problem, it's, you know, giving De detecting hypertension and then putting on, you know, decades of antihypertensive therapies or whatever it is, is, is actually much more challenging in terms of low, low resource setting, whereas maternal mortality, you can turn around in one day and make a big difference. So again, my, my passion was to try and create a device that fulfilled these criteria. And this was the birth of the cradle device. Um, so the cradle device we made, um, th the first thing is what, how do you go about it? So First of all, is you get funding. So I actually applied to um, a Gates Foundation to get a sort of entry level small grant um, to try out this device. Um, we designed it, we linked with a commercial partner who agreed they would do this at cost. Um, here they are coming off the conveyor belts, as it were, in China. I went to see the factories. And I think the key thing was to ensure quality. And I, I like this company because they had an algorithm in their blood pressure device that was suited to pregnancy. But they worked with me to tweak it, change it, and make sure it was appropriate. So that bit of time took a long time, took many years actually to get it accurate. And I'll explain that in a minute. But 
I think having a commercial partner or a partner who's willing to not go for the quick win, but get the quality right and the evidence right is a really key component here. Um, and the, again, the, the principle behind the device was if you, you know, you need vital signs to determine who, who to transport, um, the people who detect the condition and who gets the treatments are all related to vital signs measures. And, um, if you look at the causes of maternal mortality, this is data from one of my trials from eight low income countries, including India. And you can see that three quarters of the problem are hemorrhage, sepsis and hypertension, um, all of which have relatively simple treatments that are cost effective, even in a low income setting. Um, and perhaps the quickest win here is hypertension. In the literature, it's usually quoted between 10 and 12 percent. But when you go out and put the blood pressure devices everywhere, you can see that it represents nearly a quarter of deaths. And I think that's a sort of data acquisition issue. So I think it's a more common problem than the literature suggests. So this is contemporaneous um, sort of low resource data from a thousand maternal deaths um, from eight countries. And I think it represents a, a good snapshot of where the problem lies. And the great thing about hypertension, if there is a great thing, is that you can detect it nice and early, long before a woman is sick. You can deliver the baby in a timely manner and you can save a life. So there's a relatively established pathway to making a difference. Hemorrhage and sepsis are a bit more challenging in that they are more acute. Um, but nevertheless, the treatments for those things, again, are relatively simple and cheap, whether they be drugs to keep the uterus contracted um, or access to surgery, which actually is pretty much available anywhere in the world now. So um, or, or antibiotics, fluids for sepsis. So we, you can see that we were targeting things that were uh, definitely treatable. The problem being the woman had to be in the right place to receive it. And so the idea of the, of the, the you know, detecting it was to triage the woman appropriately. Now, um, to illustrate the importance of evidence and accuracy, here is a device which we sent off to KwaZulu in South Africa, and they opened it and took it to the first patient in the ward who just had an eclamptic fit. They took a blood pressure and immediately discovered the woman was hypertensive with a systolic 145, a little up arrow and an amber light flashing at them. Their, their new bit of kit was telling them that she was normotensive with a diastolic of 66, as it happens. So they immediately say, oh, we like your machine. We, this Atlantic woman is clearly hypertensive, but our machine was telling us she wasn't. And this is an illustration of how oscillometric blood pressure devices under read blood pressure in preeclampsia. And this is, there's the, there are various technical reasons why that happens. It's to do with um, the, the, the way the signal is uh, caught by the machine. Uh, picking up oscillations, which are different in preeclampsia because of the pathophysiology. There's less intravascular volume, there's higher um, peripheral resistance, there's, there's edema, there's all sorts of reasons why the machine underreads. So we spent a lot of time making sure our machine was accurate. Now, here's another picture illustrating this. And this was in Sierra Leone. One of my research fellows sent me this and said, <clears throat> they don't like your machine, Andy, because it's telling, telling you you've got ridiculous readings, whereas this blood pressure is only 160, 110, or your machine saying it's 210, 140. And I said, are you sure it isn't 210, 140? Because I know it's accurate. And sure enough, that woman went blind about an hour later. And I'm pretty confident she had very severe um, blood pressure that was missed because of the difference between this and the current ICU machines. And the problem is our machine is very simple and cheap. It only costs $20. It looks simple. And therefore, people assume the big expensive machine with lots of bells and whistles is better. And the, the fact of the matter is it's not validated. So how do you know the machine is accurate? We have a team working in South Africa who basically spend three to six months on each device um, checking it for accuracy. Um, it's a double-headed stethoscope. It's two blinded um, people and a, and a third observer kind of coordinating it, taking hundreds and hundreds of readings on multiple patients with different characteristics. And then we tweak the machine and uh, essentially we, you know, th through our knowledge, we know how to tweak the machine to make it accurate. So we, we spend a lot of time, the best part of eight years, getting this accuracy right. And although the accuracy is not the thing that people notice on the device, it's the one thing that really matters. And there's only one of five machines in the world really that's accurate in preeclampsia. This has this algorithm has FDA approval for measurement in preeclampsia. 
And we did a number of research studies to show that it's accurate, both in non-pregnant people, <clears throat> those with preeclampsia, and uniquely in very low blood pressure, because we wanted the device to measure blood pressure um, in, in, in shock. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a minute about the development of that. So we wanted the device to be um, suited, and we, we went through all that criteria of it being robust and cheap and you know, being able to take 20,000 readings without breaking and so on. <clears throat> but we also wanted features that made it suitable for a low income setting. And one of the things was recognition for people who are relatively untrained. And we did a lot of qualitative work around the traffic light. And we actually worked out that everybody in the world understands the traffic light, red, amber, green, red, red, yellow, green, whatever you call it. Some people in South Africa, they'll call it a robot, you know, whatever it is. But it's pretty a, a pretty sort of common um, language. I noticed in Freetown and Sierra Leone last week, there was only one traffic light in the whole city and it was broken. Um, but nevertheless, um, it does seem that everybody knows what red, amber, green is. And we did features like, was it flashing? Was it constant? And a lot of qualitative work around it. We also needed to do something that would take the device anywhere in the world. And we, we did a few solutions here. We looked at solar panels. We looked at all sorts of other things. In the end, we came up with the idea of a mini USB charger because we realized the whole world has access to mobile phones. And it doesn't matter where you go there's always a mini USB charger, whether it be on a car battery or a solar panel. And we've done work in refugee camps in North Uganda, in places like Mali, uh, very remote areas. And we've never had a problem with charging. One charge um, on a sealed lithium battery will give you about three to 400 readings. So um, this was a simple solution, technical solution to, to a practical problem. Um, we then moved into Cradle 2, which was um, a bigger project. So, so you say, well, how do you move forward? Well, first of all, from as an academic, I get academic funding. So I convinced the Gates Foundation to give us a million dollars for the next phase. Um, and I think what happens is if you're successful in one bit, you then move on to the next bit. And um, we essentially use the prototype in these various countries in collaboration with Peter Van Adelson, um, taking it on 60,000 readings, and this included India with a clip trial and, and got a really good experience about how the device works and its acceptability and various other qualitative issues. However, during this phase, we realized we wanted to detect hemorrhage and sepsis. And this, I guess, is slightly where a where AI might come into here. So I'll, I'll tell you why I thought about this. So this paper back from 2006 is a study looking at whether an ectopic pregnancy is ruptured or not. Um, now, for those of you who are not in obstetrics and gynecology, a, a big dilemma for any reproductive health doctor is when a woman comes in with an ectopic pregnancy, um, if it ruptures, it's kind of, uh, internal bleeding, it's very difficult to know whether the pain is just the ectopic or the pain is due to bleeding. If it is bleeding actively, that's very serious and dangerous. You can lose a lot of blood quickly and it's potentially life-threatening or, or fatal. So one of the big conundrums is, is the ectopic ruptured or not? And obviously we use vital signs to tell us if the, if the patient is compromised. And this study essentially looked at comparing, measuring blood pressure measuring the pulse or measuring combinations of the both to determine if the ectopic was ruptured. And interestingly, if you include the pulse, you get pretty accurate indication whether the ectopic is ruptured. If you include the pulse and the blood pressure, basically by dividing the pulse by the systolic, you get the best prediction. And interestingly, if you take blood pressure alone, and presumably your blood pressure goes up when you're in pain, so that might be a sort of confounder, um, it actually is not a good um, detector of rupture. So basically those two lines in the top left-hand corner tell, tell us that pulse is really important. And those lines in the bottom right tells us that blood pressure is useless at telling us of uh, rupture. So, uh, so really with that in mind, I thought, wow, you know, we pulse is what really matters here. And um, taking pulse and then um, making sure that the user knows about it is key. And so we did some research on retrospective data sets that we had our hands on from Suella Miller 
looking at the shop garment, we had thousands of patients from places like Nigeria and Egypt and so on, um, a number of, you know, 50, 60 who had died. And we basically worked out what levels we should use of the shock index for maternity. And to, again, to cut a long story short, this is what we worked out. So a shock index of 1.7, which basically means your pulse divided by your systolic. So in other words, if your pulse is going at 170, your systolic is 100, um, uh, that's quite low or worse, you will trigger a red light. And conversely, if you know your, your, your systolic is 100 and your pulse is 90 um, or better, you will trigger a green light. So this gives us a sort of, and the, the shock index is out there in the kind of trauma world, but no device in the world has incorporated it to actually measure it. And certainly no device has got a sort of alerting system. So this was our kind of novel idea to put into the machine. So the next thing is, does this actually tell us what we want it to tell us prospectively? So having done the retrospective studies, that was it. The other bit of AI, I guess here is, we needed a very accurate pulse. And when you are taking a blood pressure reading, the, the cuff deflates slowly over about 20, 30 seconds. In pregnancy, because of your increased intravascular volume, you have quite a lot of what we call sinus dysrhythmia. So there's a constant change in, in respiration with the venous return to the heart, the heart speeds up, slows down. And it's quite easy to get sampling errors with the pulse rate. You know, you get palpitations, you get odd misbeats, stuff like this. So we used an algorithm on the pulse, which is uh, quite simple, but quite clever, I think, is we looked at the, the intervals between the QRS complexes. We basically took the, the, the quarter that had the shortest intervals, we took the quarter that had the longest intervals, and we excluded them. We then took the average of the middle half um, to give us the accurate pulse rate. So we wanted to get pulse right in terms of putting it into an algorithm that was going to tell us um, whether to act or not. We then did a prospective study in South Africa, um, looking at three hospitals, every single woman who was hypertensive, every single woman who had PPH, um, and we measured their lights. And essentially, with the shock lights, um, if you actually got a red light, two thirds of those women ended up in ICU. If you had a red light, one third died, one third ended up with major surgery, i.e. laparotomies, and one third had hysterectomies. So red light was bad news. I, I think we knew that we had a good positive prediction with a red light. But, but more importantly, perhaps, is the green light. Nobody died. Nobody had major surgery. Nobody had a hysterectomy. So we, we thought this could be a reliable rule out, which is what we really wanted for rural areas in Africa. Um, and obviously this was a, a in-hospital setting, so we have to replicate this. Now, again, from an AI perspective, we had some conflicts between um, hypertension and hypotension alerting systems. As you can imagine, it's possible to be hypertensive, but so shocked that you still might trigger um, a shock indicator when your pulse is going very fast. So we had, we had to work through those issues and we came up with this algorithm. And essentially, if we decided that shock would overrule hypertension simply because if you're bleeding or septic, that's more urgent than hypertension. And there, but either way, you would get an alerting light. So that gives you some insight into the algorithms we were using. We collected data from 1500 preeclamptic women and found some very interesting things, which was actually the birth of our cradle four trial. Um, one of the things we realized in this lot is that 20% of the babies were dying. And the vast majority of those babies in South Africa, for every one that died postnatally, 30 were dying in utero. And this concept of delivering a baby early in a low income setting is very challenging because people don't want to do it. They don't have neonatal facilities. But we learned from this evidence that you might save lives even by delivering a baby earlier in a, in a challenging setting because the morbidity was happening in utero, not ex utero. And this is why we're now doing another trial looking at slightly early delivery in preeclampsia in India and in um, Zambia at the moment. So. I guess my theme here is if you're going to take something to market, you want to get the evidence for us. And so, so we've been doing trial after trial um, to look into this. And interestingly, we found some very interesting things. For example, you know, the women are getting eclampsia here, and we had 150 women with eclampsia. Um, and we found that um, the, the sort of women getting eclampsia were the teenagers and the people who are underweight 
you know, very not typical of the sort of people who get preeclampsia. Um, so, for example, if you were under 19 years old, you had 30% risk of eclampsia, whereas um, if you're over 30, it was only 3.5%. And equally, those with a BMI under 18.5 was a 40% risk of eclampsia. So these, these are kind of interesting findings that we had. Um, we, we, we also found out that creatinine was a massive problem. And we are now starting up a point of care creatinine test in Sierra Leone because about 15% of women have acute kidney injury, which certainly just does not get recognized. Um, so again, we are using you know, this evidence to drive our future kind of technology looks um, in a low income setting. Um, now, I'm going to tell you, Aris did say to me, you were quite interested in design of trials and how to move forward with an intervention. Um, and once we kind of created the device, <clears throat> we wanted to know, would, would it actually make a difference? And we went out there and looked at the outcome measures. The first thing to say is outcome measures are very challenging in the low income setting. We wanted to have stroke. We wanted to have ICU in our outcome measures. And first of all, you need to spend time getting that right. What we realized was that high dependency areas and acute ICU areas, even in kind of, you know, urban areas, big centers in Africa are, are a nonsense because they're always full. Therefore, it's a meaningless process measure. It's a meaningless outcome measure. So we had to exclude those from our trials. And we had to go for something that was easily measurable and unequivocal. So therefore, you're either dead or alive. Your uterus is either taken out or it hasn't. You've either had a fit or you haven't. So that's relatively easy things to count. And if you're going for big samples over big areas, your staff have to spend a lot of time getting this right. And it's actually quite challenging getting all the maternal deaths, especially in rural areas. Um, so if you're going to do a trial in a low income setting, you've got to go for simple stuff that is easily measurable. But obviously, it's important stuff like deaths. So that was the first kind of lesson we learned from that. The other useful thing is the design of trials because of the challenging with individual consent. Although I'm doing individual consent in Cradle 5, and that's a big challenge. But for these kind of big cluster trials, a step wedge design is really useful because if you've got an intervention, what you actually do is you, you put it in at regular intervals. That means the same team can go around and gain experience and train. So you don't need to put it all in at once, which can be really difficult, but you can use the same team to go in a steps trial. And what you actually end up doing, um, it, it, this actually is, isn't is a, from a different trial, but um, it gives you an idea of how it works. Don't worry about the, the hospitals, this is not, um, but it just shows you how you compare all the green outcomes with all the red outcomes. And we did something very similar for the cradle device here. Um, we didn't have the cradle device and you randomize which centers get it for the first half and you compare it to those who get it in the second half. So our cradle trial was done in all these countries. Where to go for a trial? We deliberately picked urban areas where we could access data relatively easily rather than rural areas um, and we and actually most of the deliveries for us were happening even though this is only a relatively small geographical component in the country many deliveries end up happening in, happening in an urban area so we were able to tackle it and if the device doesn't work in that area it probably won't work in a rural area however our ongoing work now is to looking at looking scaling up in the whole country for example in, in um, Sierra Leone and also we we're about to try and do this in Zambia as well so you've got to do a step at a time to so go for the quick wins like the urban areas and then go for the the, the more challenging rural areas is kind of my advice if, if that's what you want to do. Um, and also get some diversity in your in your setups. You know, the healthcare structures are very different in all these areas. So Haiti will have a very many traditional birth attendants and, and often home, um, you know, big, big centers in places like Lusaka, where there are tens of thousands of deliveries, relatively smaller units and multiple ones in India. So, so it, it gives you some diversity and generalizability in your results. And we published this in Lancet Global. Um, what we learned was there's big intercluster variation and, and actually it's quite challenging doing these trials. Um, we were able to train and we learned that the way to train is keep things simple. So if you've got a, some intervention you wanna get out there, you have to make sure that the training is simple and not complex. So we used videos and we use simple things like, you know, um, infographics. 
And to give you some insight into what happened in the trial is um, there were a lot of deaths. Um, we had nearly a thousand deaths. Um, there were two and a half thousand atlantic fits. Now, to put this in perspective, magnesium sulfate is a drug that we all use regularly in maternal care. It's a kind of standard of care now for women with severe preeclampsia. The evidence base on that was taken from 25 countries and there were only 140, I think, um, eclamptic fits in that trial that has established a rock hard kind of evidence base. So to get nearly two and a half thousand eclamptic fits, I think was quite a staggering achievement. And we had enough power for, for to get results in individual countries, even though overall we had too much variation across countries um, to show um, whether we ha had significance or not. The other important thing is over time, things are getting better. So we actually demonstrated that during the course of the trial, our mortality rates and our kind of primary outcome, which was a combination of hysterectomy, eclampsia and death, was steadily dropping and significantly so. So you have to take this into account and do the, you know, look at the confounders um, over time, because there's all sorts of variations in these countries. When we were working there, there were, there were strikes in some countries, there were um, hurricanes, there was all sorts of other stuff. You also have to keep an eye on what else is going on. So we looked, big implementation science issue here. So we work with an implementation science, social science professor. We look at stuff like training individuals who are using the device, uh, facilities available, provision of blood, drugs, you name it, over time, so that we can link those things to the intervention success or failure. Um, so it's really important if you're doing studies, that not just to look at clinical outcomes, but to look at other outcomes. And our current trial that we're just starting off in Sierra Leone is what's called a type two hybrid implementation trial. So we equally weight the clinical outcomes with the, with the process measures. Um, so that we can learn as we go along, you know, are people taking the blood pressure? Are they actually providing the care? Because these are complex situations about saving a life. Taking a blood pressure measurement doesn't save a life. It's the action from that blood pressure measurement that saves the life. And so the other thing, if you actually want to evaluate your intervention, is you, you have to spend time looking at everything, not just clinical outcomes. When we adjusted for all these things, we couldn't really demonstrate a, ch a change overall, but we did show um, a big reduction in hysterectomies, which I think is interesting because even after confounders are taken into account, this was a real finding. So we're very ex excited about that. We, we also wanted to make sure we weren't causing a problem. I think if you're working in a low income setting, you don't want to um demonstrate that you cause a problem because if you introduce a device and suddenly you increase resource use you're going to cause a huge issue because we know that you know ambulance services and all the rest of it are pretty precious interestingly overall we showed no difference in referral patterns um in the reason um, um we, we actually showed reduction in some countries like Haiti, Sierra Leone and Zambia of the primary outcome, but not others. And when we looked at the reasons why, it's a bit like if you introduce a blood pressure device to London, you're not going to impact on mortality because mortality is already low. If you introduce, introduce it to somewhere that has no facilities, you're not going to have an impact because you can't do anything with the knowledge. So this was a real lesson for us that you've got to look at the reasons why things are happening. And these implementation science publications show a nice correlation between you know, various things going on in the background. Uh, um, and, and we've learned a lot from that. Some individual countries like Sierra Leone, we had this remarkable reduction in all, even significance in death reduction, um, because it just worked well in that environment. Um, and we think there was a nice combination of the facilities available, um, plus the, the kind of poor outcome measures. And Sierra Leone for us, was this is a paper from PLOS Medicine that we published showing very high rates of um, mortality related to preeclampsia, um, which is one of the reasons we're concentrating there now to make a difference. And, and you know, five times greater than um, Zambia, for example. Um, 
so again, good good idea to keep an eye on it. The other interesting thing, and I just wanted to share this with you, is because we had so many eclamptic fits, we actually did some sort of uh, exploratory analysis. Um, I was always very interested. Everyone keeps telling me in places like Sierra Leone and when I worked in South Africa that eclampsia and preeclampsia is much worse at uh, different types of times of the year. And the sisters always used to predict when we would get a lot of eclamptic fits. And it was often when the weather was cold in Johannesburg when I, when I worked there. And I was always trying to work out why this was the case and never could. And then it suddenly dawned on me that it may be related to in-house air pollution because people start lighting fires indoors instead of outdoors when it's cold. And therefore, I did this quick correlation between our eclamptic rates versus the in-house death pollution, uh, deaths occurring due to air pollution and found this pretty good correlation. And it made perfect sense to me that if you have indoor noxious substances and you have preeclampsia, it probably tips the threshold for you having a fit. So a very simple mechanism. And again, this is kind of an interesting observation, which, um, uh, you know, Aris, I'll just point this out to you. Um, I can't get anyone to publish it, but I think it's really important. I might send it your way. Um, and this also, you know, advertising, I like to show this one because this is back in Malawi where, um, you know, I used to speak to Chewa when I was a kid. And so it's nice seeing the cradle device appearing on a on a advertising um, board um, in, in a language I learned as a kid. Um, the other thing to say is this is like an interesting concept. When we put the device out there, we were very worried about causing a problem. When I was in Harare, I noticed that what would happen in a sort of rural, ruralish area, 50 kilometers out of the city, is a woman would have a massive PPH. She would then take the one ambulance and be sent in to the unit. The next three or four big PPHs had no transport. And if they were really bad, they would die and, have, and there would be a problem. However, what we discovered was the shock index seemed to triage correctly. In other words, if the first woman with a PPH was relatively well, she wasn't transferred. And then when the next woman was more severe, she was transferred. So when you have limited resources, you need to target them appropriately. And what we found in all countries, which was, was well, not all countries, but nearly all countries, was there's this pretty consistent reduction of about 50% in our referrals for severe bleeding. Um, and actually, we just looked at our data in Sierra Leone again with the ambulance service, and we found exactly the same as reduction in bleeding referrals and an increase in hypertensive referrals in association with scaling up the device over the whole country. Um, and we think this is really important because um, if you triage appropriately with and we have this in association with a massive reduction in hysterectomies. Um, so we think there hasn't been worse outcomes. There's been improved triage. The other thing to do is the qualitative work over the um, device. And so this particular study, um, we looked at how well people were taking the blood pressure readings later on. So we would sneak back nine months later, we would sit in a corner and watch people using the device and seeing whether they had carried on using the training we implemented a year earlier. And the very interesting finding here, which I was delighted with, is that the least trained healthcare professionals carried on doing the best measurements. And so they, they you know, busy, busy clinicians often take shortcuts, but actually when it comes to blood pressure measurement, that can cause a huge problem because you miss problems and you, you know, un miss cases and you overdiagnose hypertension and all the rest of it. So very simple things like repeating the reading after two minutes with a rest um, or, uh, you know, explaining the procedure or, or uh, applying the cuff correctly. These are all important things, but, but our healthcare assistants were much better than the nurses. Um, and the least trained you were, the better you were. So good kind of example. And we had over 420 focus groups all over the world looking at this. The other phenomenon is op opinion leaders often diss the device. If you take a device in, into a, a new area, they look at it, they go, oh, this is cheap and nasty. It's different from my fancy machine. This is rubbish. They then tell everyone else it's rubbish and everyone doesn't like it. If you systematically take qualitative work from everybody, 
then everybody likes it. And then you have the evidence to go back to the opinion leaders and go, I know you don't like this, but look at this evidence, look at the accuracy, and then you convince them it's okay. And this is really important because we have one individual clinic or hospital may not like it. And when you go back and look at why, it's often an opinion leader who has a misconception about the device. So this is another kind of lesson learned. Um, tackle the opinion leaders and do the systematic qualitative work over the acceptability of a, of a product. Here's me in Kanataka really illustrating um, how the ushers there were just brilliant. And no matter how much we asked them about, you know, how would you like to change this? What don't you like about it? They were just saying this is fantastic. And, and the acceptability to the shop floor people um, is so important. And I just kind of, this is us in a, in a primary care facility um, in fairly rural Connecticut. Um, and and that, that, this is where you need to go to find out if a product really works. Um, and this is a, a picture from Mali. Again, you know, I think the figure now is probably near 50,000 in about 50 countries. There are many reasons why people die. And I just wanted to share with you some offshoots that we found from the cradle device. As what we found was the referrals for anemia uh, uh, for the amber light, the shock amber light escalated in India, but nowhere else. And we, we, we were asked why, and because we were in rural Connecticut, I think severe anemia is a big problem there because of the iron deficiency. Um, so we've actually done some work here to look at the value of screening for anemia with a shock index. And actually it does have um, quite an interesting value. Um, and again, trying to get that published. We've gone into rural camps to look at referrals in refugee camps um, in Uganda. So in Bidi Bidi, for example, we discovered that the shock index was a really good way to pick up malaria from the most distant parts of the refugee camp, where your, your actual relative risk of having malaria is more than tenfold. You know, the likelihood ratio is actually more than tenfold um, for picking up severe malaria. So as a sort of, you know, distant way of picking up malaria um, in these challenging areas and getting them to a clinic where you can actually then do a proper you know, blood test to confirm it or refute it. We think this has kind of a potential, but this work needs to continue and go elsewhere. And we're looking at ways of taking things like um, charging into the rural camp. Now, a quick lesson here about implementation. Um, this is me taking a picture of a light in Zimbabwe because electricity in Zimbabwe was very challenging and kept on often wasn't there and while we were training the trainers we had no electricity um, but actually we use smartphones and smartphones with videos can then you bluetooth across to all the healthcare smartphones and so we spent two hours training a hundred healthcare providers they all went out to their clinics and each of them trained another 10 people so in one day, we were able to train 2,000 people. And then the next three days, we randomly went to some of the peripheral clinics. And sure enough, everyone had seen the video in 48 hours. And that was with no electricity available. So you can use modern technology, batteries, iPhones, to actually disseminate training very quickly, even when the, the, the shop floor club, healthcare providers have no facilities. Because generally speaking your kind of nurses will have smartphones and they can show videos and train videos very quickly i took that picture because the light had come on which hadn't been on all year and everyone was very excited to see a street light on the only problem was it was on all day and off all night but that was quite kind of amusing the other issue is um i'm just going to talk a bit about a study that we've done in the uk called phoenix which we published in the lancet with lucy chapel um showing that if you deliver people a little bit earlier with preeclampsia between 34 and 37 weeks, the mother is better off. I won't spend much time on this, but we also know that the baby isn't any worse off. Okay, so to cut a long story short, if you actually deliver people a bit earlier, you're also more likely to end up having a normal vaginal delivery. And basically taking this into a low income setting, I think is a real key thing. So our Cradle 4 project, is delivering babies a bit earlier, both in India and in Zambia. And this is what we are currently looking at. We're about three quarters of the way through now. Um, and uh, I just, again, you know, getting more and more evidence to show 
uh, policy people. And one of the big things we're doing in Sierra Leone is we're working with the policy units and with the health economy people to make sure we have the hard evidence of the impact of the device. And I think that later work on that side, which isn't usually the remit of an academic, I think is important. So, so my lessons are implementation science, health economy, policy engagement are all really key if you want your device to have sustainability in the long term. Um, I'm just going to, you know, say we, we've uh, gone into Sierra Leone now. We've got funding from a global health, from the NIHR to run a global health research group to concentrate on all these things and capacity build locally. And I think that's one of the advantages of academia. You can get funding through quite good sources. Um, and again, the, the one thing we have a problem with is because we had arrangements with with Microlife to sell this at cost is they don't really, they're not really incentivized to distribute it. They're not a big distrib distribution company. And so we're having to work with the WHO and with others to kind of look at the barriers. So things like getting devices into country are quite challenging because they are low cost. Um, there isn't really any incentive for distribution. And we do sell them in the UK and as slight markup and therefore there's a bit more incentive for people to send them out to, to companies that might do that distribution. But the one thing I learned if I had my time again was you have to look at that commercial link early on to make sure the sustainability is achievable later. So that's the headaches we have now, although lots of people like the device. India is a case in point. You know, my colleagues there want to sell it, want to distribute it, but they can't because it's too low cost and there's no incentive to do it. So but that's a still a bit of a barrier for us and something to kind of maybe maybe consider. I'm going to just um, finish now by talking about, you know, the bigger picture here about um, engagement. One of my PhD students has actually got funding just finishing off now um, from Arts and Humanities Council because we've been working with uh, making films and doing dramas to disseminate knowledge. I think one of the things about care and about getting something out there is, is acceptance and uptake. And for the women to take to, to, to act on the device is as important for healthcare professionals to act on the device. So persuading them to turn up, the first delay, often people know a bit of the gadget is in the antenatal facilities. They like being scanned. They like having their blood pressure measurement. That actually breaks down the first delay considerably. And then the second delay, when a woman sees a traffic light, which she understands, that might persuade her to pay for the bus fare and go away from her family and move. And that, that's a really important part of it. Um, Finally, I'll just share with you, because this is important. Thing, my, my student here, Alice, you can see in the middle, is doing a really nice PhD on Cradle 4, but she's, look, we've learned some really important things, and I just want to illustrate this. We're doing a project called Lost in Translation, and what I've realized is that the, the way most people interpret evidence on the shop floor in a low-income setting is completely different to what we think. So, for example, in Zambia, the written language is not the same as a spoken language. So writing something down for people is almost, it's not fit for purpose. And we discovered this because we put out one of our patient information leaflets, which basically said, we appreciate your time. Uh, however, there'll be no financial compensation for taking part in the study. This is kind of a standard wording from King's and from what we do in, in the UK. The person who translated it said, even if things are like this, there will be no funerals of any kind. So the word for funeral was mistranslated because it's very similar in Bemba, financial and funerals, Malapiro and Maliro. So that there was an incorrect translation. And because we did back translations, we discovered this. And when we went to speak to the translators, they said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. Of course, the first patient did die. And you know, we'd said in the in the consent form that they weren't going to die, you know, there are no funerals. So this is just something to be aware of. And we we tried to do more work here and realize that the whole context of language and information and ethics is complete nightmare and not fit for purpose. And this is something we all have to tackle, I think, for the future. Just be aware of this. And I would strongly encourage you to do back translations of anything that you're taking to the patient floor. Um, get good data because here is one of our sites this is how they store stuff there is no way you can get information when um, you have this type of data collection system and using modern technology um, 
and servers and, and clever ways of picking up information on tablets, smartphones, when there's no electricity is really key. And that's something we spent a lot of time on when we're getting information from, from the shop floor. Um, got to acknowledge the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who really started this all off. Um, we can take the technologies into a high income setting. I'm working with our health innovation network to look at the shock index in the context of high dependency care. You know, we, we, we have tick box things on our forms to tell us when patients are going off, when they have tachycardias and low blood pressures and low SATs. But even then people miss it. Um, and we think that the subtlety of a, a flashing light when people go off might pick it up earlier and we need to also take this evidence into a high income setting. This is kind of a whole new thing. And finally, I want to say the blood pressure device is suited for anyone in trauma, you know, in fire services, in um, the big wide world. And we haven't even touched on that. It's designed for low income setting, but can be used anywhere and can be used on any population basis. So there's always that sort of scale up into other worlds, which I haven't got time to do, but would be really interested if other people have time to do. Um, and I'm just going to, this is my very final slide, um, acknowledge the many, many kind of research fellows who I've listed here who've done their PhDs or are doing their PhDs with me, and also the many, many fantastic colleagues and now many good friends that I've made with this work um, from all over the world. We learn from each other, and I think um, going and listening and, and you seeing what they want, seeing what they need, uh, bringing your expertise, but don't tell people what to do, uh, has been a real key component, I think, of the research. Anyway, I, I think I'm on time, Aris, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I hope I've kind of ticked your remit. You absolutely have and more, Andy. Thank you for really a wonderful overview. And what's really impressed me is the singular focus with which you've pursued this single goal, if you like, based on a condition and based on a, a single device. Give us an idea of maybe the length of time. I know you went through all the different cradle um, uh, device development uh, phases. Uh, uh, how, how long do you think, well, when, when, when did you start, if you like, the, the beginning? Uh, well, I mean, I the, first, the beginning first... may be difficult to define as a, as a point. No, sure. but, uh, well, I mean, I... I did my higher degree on blood pressure measurement and um, had an interest. And obviously my experience in the past had a passion for the maternal mortality in the world. So th th those seeds were set from just my own personal kind of career. Um, I came up with the idea after the WHO committee, which was published, published its requirements in 2005. It took the mm. best part of eight years to get the algorithm right. Um, because it just takes so long to tweak, reanalyze, tweak, reanalyze, tweak, reanalyze different patient populations. The bells and whistles on the device really came on quite rapidly in recent years um, with a, you know, over a kind of two year grant type, two, three years, um, getting the changes, the prospective evidence around the things I just presented. Um, so that, and everyone likes the bells and whistles, the traffic lights, the mini USB charging, all that, the shock index. But actually the thing I'm most proud about is having a device that actually measures blood pressure accurately, um, because that is a game changer for the world and for everyone, not just low income setting. And getting that message over to clinicians is quite challenging. I still get people going, for, you know, the, 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 the senior clinician in a hospital will go, this machine's rubbish because it's different from my machine. Um, and just kind of dissing it with the importance of that accuracy, as has been illustrated time and time again with anecdotes, um, it can't be understated. And like I said, that, that was the, the first thing was getting it right. And that, you know, so this has probably taken a decade to get to this point. Thank you, Andy. Well, you, you should be proud of what's been uh, an, an amazing achievement with what clearly has been uh, impactful work uh, on the ground with uh, reduction in maternal mortality, uh, which was your ambition and aim.